Hello, humans. <laughs> Who do we have out there? We got some folks tuning in, it looks like. Uh, see some numbers popping up, so I'm glad to see you. Um, thanks to those of you who are already online. If you are tuned in, go ahead and pop a little comment in wherever you're watching and just let me know where you're watching from so we can see what kind of an international audience I'm sure we have since we do have an international host and guest arrangement today. Uh, so uh, this is the Tech Humanist Show. Of course, you are in the right classroom, I hope. <laughs> it's a multimedia format program exploring data, how data and technology shape the human experience. I'm Kate O'Neill. Uh, so please subscribe or follow wherever you're checking this out so you won't miss any new episodes. <gasps> Tammy Evans says we love Kate O'Neill. Well, I love you, Tammy Evans. I'm so glad you're here. St. <laughs> Petersburg, Florida. But it's a little warmer uh, there. I mean, it's been very nice here, but I don't know. Is it hot in St. Petersburg right now? I don't know if it's miserably hot or nice. It seems like it's probably nice. Um, I am so glad to have some folks tuning in and showing up. I'm excited because today I'm going to go ahead and talk about our guest, which is probably why a lot of you are tuned in. Oh, hey, Ted Poulton tuning in from Connecticut. Hi. Glad to see you. Uh, today, we are talking with Rahaf Harfouj, who is a strategist, digital anthropologist, and best-selling author who focuses on the intersections between emerging technology, innovation, and digital culture. She is the executive director of the Red Thread Institute of Digital Culture and teaches innovation and emerging business models at Science Politique. She'll have to tell me if I pronounce that well enough. Uh, Science Po, <laughs> it's how I always see it, School of Management and Innovation in Paris. She is currently working on her fourth book. Uh, we'll talk about that. And her third book, entitled Hustle and Float, Reclaim Your Creativity and Thrive in a World Obsessed with Work, was released in 2019. She's been featured by Bloomberg, the CBC, CTV, and Forbes for her work on for workplace culture. Formerly, Rahaf was the Associate Director of the Technology Pioneer Program at the World Economic Forum in Geneva, where she helped identify disruptive startups that were improving the state of the world. Rahaf is the co-author of The Decoded Company, Know Your Talent Better Than You Know Your Customers, and her first book, Yes We Did, An Insider's Look at How Social Media Built the Obama Brand, chronicled her experiences as a member of Barack Obama's digital media team during the 2008 presidential elections, and explored how social networking revolutionized political campaign strategy. Rahaf has been named one of the most innovative women in France, one of the top future thinkers to shape the world, a young global changer, and a Canadian Arab to watch. Rahaf's writing has been featured in HBR, Wired, The Globe and Mail, Fast Company, and many more. She's a frequent commentator on France 24 and the CBC in her spare time, which <laughs> doesn't sound like she probably doesn't have any. Rahaf enjoys Instagramming too many pictures of her dog, Pixel. And as an Instagram follower, I can tell you they are adorable. Learning how to play the ukulele and working on her first novel. We'll check in on the ukulele and novel status in just a little bit. So audience, start getting your questions ready for our fantastic guest and my friend. Please do note that as a live show, we'll do our best to vet comments and questions in real time. So we may not get to all of them, but we really appreciate you being here, tuning in, and participating in the show. So with that, please welcome my friend, Rahaf Harfouj, who is here. You are live on the Tech Humanist Show. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi. Hi. Oh, your intro was so infectious. I honestly felt my mood just like lift up 10 <laughs> points, just like seeing your sparkly, bubbly energy. <laughs> Isn't it so fun, too, to have your bio read and be like, that person sounds really impressive. <laughs> I'm always like, you know, you know, it's always so weird to hear people read things about you. Um, but uh, it's always so nice to have like such great friends that you can have. I'm so excited for this chat. I've been looking forward to it. Me too. I've been harassing you to have me on since you started. Oh, so. please. I was like, you were the, <laughs> one of the first people I thought, oh, I've got to have a hot on. So I refer your work constantly. I don't know if you know this, but people so often ask me about the impact of tech on our everyday lives. So if I'm doing a talk on tech in the, uh, in the workplace in terms of digital transformation or whatever, I get questions about things like, you know, tech overload and how we personally use tech. And I'm always like, you know, that's a really important and interesting question. I am not an expert on that. You should totally check out my friend Rob's <laughs> book. And I've handed your copies of your book to so many people. Uh, so I am very curious to hear, you know, basically with, with COVID changing everything in the landscape, like how has that tech and personal experience experience relationship changed for you or what's been happening re relative to that for you? 
Um, well, for me, I think it just amplified uh, a lot of the issues that I had with the way that we were using technology before. So um, I, I, I've been very careful and with my work been very intentional about the type of information that I consume and the amount of time I spent on certain platforms. But I noticed that in my social networks and in my friend groups that people were home more, obviously mm -hmm. we were under lockdown for several months. And so what can we do, but turn to our online, to this never ending sphere of content and distraction and connections. And I noticed in the first couple of weeks, everyone was all about the zoom everything's and then there was like a zoom burnout and uh for me i think there's a couple of big issues at play and we can dive into whichever one you want the first is that we have more bandwidth because we're at home so we're like consuming more information for better or for worse i say for worse because i think with so much uncertainty a lot of these platforms uh leverage this like addictive constant refresh breaking news cycle and with something as complex and nuanced as covid i know many of us were glued to our screens refreshing 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 the latest news right uh, and I don't know about you, but that was not the best thing I could have done for my mental well-being <laughs> or anxiety. It was at one point I was like, I need to take a step away because I'm just addicted to like the news of it instead of actually increasing my information or my knowledge. Right. Um, and the other thing is, I think that for many people, uh, at least for people in our line of work, you know, where we travel a lot, uh, the forced pause in many cases. Uh, made us realize that we or some of us use productivity as a coping mechanism. So suddenly we had more time. And what does that mean that to have more time? And so I saw people starting to try to make their personal time as productive as their professional time and really pushing themselves to like pick up 10 new hobbies and learn 10 new languages and take 10 new classes. And one or two of those things is great, but I really saw people loading up. And that was a good indication to me of our our like lack of comfort with not doing anything. Yeah. And so I feel like tech just brought a lot of that to the surface. So is uh, the the goal to learn ukulele and write a novel? Those were pre-COVID goals. Those were a hundred percent pre-COVID goals. <laughs> and you know, there was a point in time where I was feeling quite low about everything, and and then I noticed I was guilting myself for not writing and not learning and not doing all these things, and then. I was like, you know what, like we are undergoing this immensely traumatic, super stressful thing. Like it's okay to not do anything. It's okay yeah. to just recover and rest. Like that's fine. And I just yeah. put all those things to the, to the side during that like peak lockdown period. And it was like really scary. It was. And I think, I think it was scary in a background way. So it was really hard to allow ourselves to acknowledge that it was scary, right? It's this kind of muted undertone of scariness. That's not something like I that... almost would have preferred zombie. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> the sun was shining right. and we couldn't see anything, but it was so scary outside, but like everything looked normal, but it wasn't normal. I, I found the whole thing to be quite unsettling. And that's different from from a normal, uh, you know, unhealthy relationship with tech <laughs> in the sense that I think we always have, you know, we always had this tendency to have kind of a an always on work access and you know, being always connected to social and there's like the whole FOMO culture and everything. Um, but I, I think what's so interesting about your book, I mean, there are many interesting things about your book, but one is that what you're really talking about, it seems like on one level is about creativity and how to be your most creative self and in a sense your most productive self but not productive in the kind of hustle porn sort of way it's more like your most authentically productive or your most authentically creative self is that a fair characterization yeah, I think the word creative has such such a hot word for people. Like people either love it or they hate it. They either totally associate or don't. They either say, yes, that's me or that's not me. But I believe my definition of creativity is pretty much all of knowledge work. So if you are a researcher or a marketer or a comms person or an accountant or a lawyer, if you are solving problems and figuring things out and coming up with new ideas, like you're, you're a creative, you're a professional creative. And many of us have big goals and big things and big problems that we're working on and these uh, large ambitions we want to accomplish. And so we want to achieve things. We want to produce things. We want to be productive. But the problem is, 
is that the systems that are put into place of how many of us currently measure our productivity were never designed for us. So they were never made for us and the type of work that we do. And not only were they never designed for us, they actively hurt us. And so my book asks this question, it kind of asks two big questions. The first is like, what would a system that was designed by creatives for creatives to do their best work look like. And I guarantee you it's not spending 16 hours a day in front of a computer. And the second thing was, is what is this interesting relationship we have with our work, whereas so many of us burn out and so many of us push ourselves to the limit despite knowing better, right? It's not like I say to you, hey, I've got this groundbreaking new idea, Kate. It's called taking a break. Like, you know what to do. I know what to do. We all know what to do, and yet we don't do it. And so it was diving into the the media aspect, the psychology, the stories that we tell ourselves and each other about like who gets to be successful and what success looks like and should we wake up at 5 a.m. and should we do, you know, all of these things tell ourselves, like build a world where we believe that only by working nonstop can we be successful. And worse, if you don't work hard enough, then we have this horrible message like, well, you just must not want your goal enough. You must not be as committed to your goal. That's not true. We as creatives, we need time to be able to build great things. We can't build great things if we don't have time to think about them. We can't think about them if we're nonstop on technology distracted all the time. Yeah, and it, there are certainly ways where that technology can help facilitate our creativity. Uh, and I believe you address many of those throughout the book. Um, but it, it's a really delicate balance, it seems like. I mean, you and I know this, and you actually, I learned this from you and your work, which is the technology itself is just a tool. It's like fire, right? I can use a fire to warm up my house, or I can use a fire to burn my house down. It depends on how I use it. And so I believe that technology can be incredibly powerful to amplifying your creativity, to connecting you with new ideas, with new people, with new avenues, with new business opportunities. But if you don't have that intentionality, it will suck your creative juice, it will distract you, it will make you feel horrible, it will corrode your attention and your focus, and it'll just make you miserable if you're not really clear about how you're using it and very intentional with how you're using it to support your creative process. Yeah, so Tammy Evans says, you are speaking to my soul. The struggle with the deep desire to create battling the woulda, coulda, shoulda is real. (laughs) Ah, Tammy, you nailed it. Yeah, right? And then Spider Graham says, it seems so paradoxical, but taking meaningful downtime can make you more productive, which I think, you know, speaks to what you're saying there. The trick is, is that for creatives, we have to balance periods where we're actually producing the thing with periods where I call it intangible creativity. A lot of the Mm. thinking you can't see. And in our culture, we don't like things that we can't see. If I can't see you working, then you must not be working. But how many of us have gone for a walk and gotten that idea or been daydreaming and gotten that idea? And so creatives, we need that downtime. We need time when we're actually not distracted. And by the way, like downtime isn't taking a coffee break and then being on social media. Downtime (laughs) is really downtime. It's daydreaming. It's just letting your brain go. And we don't do that because in our culture, any time not spent being productive is a waste, which is why we need a different framework. Because for a writer or for a strategist or for you, for you and I, you like you spend so much time thinking about things. For you to think about things, you need the time to think about them. Yeah. I mean, I ask you, how do you think? How do you carve out time in your day to just like let the ideas marinate a bit? I remember early in my career, I had jobs where my title was tech writer or where writing was a big part of the job I was doing. And I actually had a sign posted at my desk that said, a writer is writing even when staring into space. (laughs) Oh, I love that. That's exactly it. Yeah. And I feel like it's a really important framework to establish with people that like, don't interrupt me just because I'm sitting here. And Ravi and I have a, a sort of method where since we share our living room as a workspace, if we have headphones on, that's like sacred time. <laughs> Do not interrupt each other. And so you may put on headphones and not be listening to anything, but it's just to carve out that isolation and that time to just be. Uh, and that might be in front of a screen or it might not, uh, but but just having that that isolation is is still really helpful. Um, um, Georgia O'Neill, my mother, says, I'm trying to create a balance, but that's a challenge. It really is. 
Georgia, your daughter is a delight and you should be so <laughs> proud of her. She's one of my favorite people. Don't but it feed is. her. She'll totally go <laughs> off on it. <laughs> no, it is hard to find a balance. And I think it's because we've shamed ourselves into thinking that if we're not doing stuff, it's a waste. And that's the problem. The problem is, is like intentional recovery, deciding and choosing to rest as a part of your life and prioritizing that is really hard for all of us because we constantly hear these stories of CEOs and celebrities and, you know, uh, Elon Musk sleeping on the floor of his factory and Tim Cook waking up at 4.30 a.m. in the morning. So you hear all of that and then you think, I can't take a nap. I can't watch a movie. I can't go for a walk because then I don't, I'm not like committed to being successful, which is the most toxic belief system that we have incorporated into our society today, especially for creatives. Yeah. So Anna Milicevic says you hit the nail on the head with knowledge work equals creativity and then follows that up saying we're still operating on industrial era work assumptions, time for a big revamp. And I was thinking that too, as you were talking about it, that, it, you know, it's kind of like, Daydreaming and walking is not in my OKRs, so I don't know how to measure that. I don't know how to report on that. I don't know how to tell my my bosses or my clients that I'm being productive. You know that that's that's what I think is a lot of the the challenge with the framework is that we may know intuitively once we've kind of overcome that hurdle that that there is an important piece of creativity and of knowledge work that's implicit in downtime and and allowing yourself a refresh but that isn't built into our systems as Anna points out here. And the way that, I mean, you, you raise such a good point because when you start questioning the systems, if you just hold them up and just say, let's just like talk about these systems, they become even more and more absurd. It's like, okay, Kate, how many <laughs> ideas do you come up with in an eight hour day? What's your idea per hour? Rate? And you're like, well, that's not how that works. And it's like, but these are the systems. Why am I measuring, you know, the number of hours you're at your desk and somehow equating that to your creative output when really what you might need is a, a walk in Central Park or a nap or something else. Yeah, it's so, so true. When I was working on Pixels in Place, there were points where I had hit a wall just kind of conceptually and I would take my phone uh, with the dictation feature ready to go and just walk and just be thinking and walking. And then if I thought of something, I would start dictating immediately. But it might only be a few sentences and then just walk for another, you know, 10 minutes of just quiet time, but then maybe have another sentence that occurs to me. And that that kind of even those two or three sentences can really help you break through that barrier. So it is it's so important. And it's not you're right. It's not something that we can measure on an ideas per hour basis. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> it is so absurd. I really like this idea of like taking this time. Like I've started where if I want to work on a document, I'll open the document up. I'll write the title and I'll write two or three sentences of what I want the document to be about. And then I will minimize the document and I will go do something else for like yes. 30 minutes. And you wouldn't believe it. Like every single time I do that, my brain's working, working, working. And then it's like, OK, that's the first point. That's the second point. And then I come back. And it's so easy instead of what I used to do, which is like stare at my screen and tear my hair out until like I got what I needed. And it was such an unpleasant experience. So out of curiosity, have you found that to be true with fiction as well with this work of fiction that you're, yeah, you can do that. You can just start with an idea yeah. and walk away and have it be percolating in the background. The best thing I've done for myself is prep work. So like I, I break everything down in scenes. And then what I do is the night before I look at the outline of the scene that I want to work on the next day. And then I just like sleep on it. And then I wake up and I have my coffee. And like generally by that time, it it's working in the background. Like it's just because you're not actively working doesn't mean that your brain isn't still doing stuff. Your brain is constantly making connections, reviewing stuff, thinking about stuff, imagining stuff. So if you say to yourself, okay, like my two characters need to get into a bind and I need them to find a way out of this particular situation. I don't know what that is. You just kick that to the back, but your brain's like, got it. And then while you're hanging out, while you're sleeping, while you're doing stuff, it's still running in the background. It just saves a lot of that like intense effort you know, yeah. of, of having to force it. Ted Poulton says much of what you're describing is detailed in the book Stealing Fire as well, in case anybody's interested in following up on mm -hmm. that idea or that lead. Uh, Josh Canal says, how do we get people to realize that our present appearance doesn't reflect our future delivery? Well, wow, that's a really good articulation of that. What do you think, Rahaf? 
I mean, for me, the, the, the breakthrough that I had in doing this work was that it's not actually about systems or organizations. It's about us as people. Like we are our hardest taskmasters. We are our harshest bosses and we will push ourselves to the limit even when other people tell us that we should stop and take a break. And so I think if we're going to move to a more, I always say instead of human productivity, humane productivity, if we're going to move to a more humane productivity mindset, we have to face some, we have to have some uncomfortable conversations about the role of work in our lives, the link between our identity and our jobs and our self-worth, our need for validation with social media and professional recognition, our egos, all of these things like battle it out, which is why I just can't come on here and be like, okay, guys, take a break here, do this. We're, we're not going to do it. We really have to talk about questions like growing up, what did your parents teach you about work ethic? When you think about work ethic, how is that related to how you see yourself or who are the people that you admire or what does success look like to you? And then there are statements that you can ask yourselves, like, you know, if you work hard, anything is possible. like all these things, you can start testing your own relationship with work. And once you start asking yourself these questions, you start to see that we have built a relationship psychologically where we feel like if we don't work hard enough, we're not deserving of the success we have in our lives. And not only do we have to work hard, we have to suffer for it. We have to pull all nighters and think of like, like think of the words that we use hustle and grind and like all of these like horrible verbs, you know, which is why I wanted to add float into the mix. Cause yeah. doesn't float just sound so chill. <laughs> it does. <laughs> also, uh, Chris Westfall comes to your defense and says, come on, Ted, she's an original. And of course, <laughs> Of course you are. <laughs> Listen, artists steal. I, we stand on the shoulders of giants. I'm that's happy right. to be compared in the same company as like anybody that's working in this space, really. So Yeah. Also, Chris Westfall says, why are these uncomfortable conversations necessary? What's the ultimate outcome? Defining success isn't the same as achieving it, but maybe it's a start. So that articulation of what success is and, and being able to frame those questions like you're talking about, ask yourself those really important um, outlook questions of, you know, what informed your worldview on that, that that's a that seems like it's it's an important piece of the work, right? So there's the part about like your relationship with work as an individual. And it's important. And the reason why it's important to dig into that is that oftentimes our views about our work become assumptions that we don't question. So don't we don't ever stop and say, does this belief actually help me produce my best possible work? Or is it just pushing me to a point where I'm exhausted and I'm burned out? That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing is a lot of the stories that we have been told about success just like aren't true. And the way that, and I'll give you a super quick, super simple example, which is if there's an equation for success, most people think hard work equals success. Like that is the, the summary of it. But in reality, while hard work is very important, it's super important, it's not the only variable. Where you're born, your serendipity, your, you know, like the, the birth lottery element, your luck, your gender, your, all of these things are little variables that add into the equation. So what I don't like about the hard work equals success is the flip side of that tells people that, well, if you're not successful, it must be because you're not working hard enough. And right. part of the awakening is to understand that there are other factors at play here and we're all working pretty hard. And so we don't need more things telling us that we're not enough and we're not worthy. That also seems like a distinctly American mythology. And what I particularly love about your uh, background and your bio is that your intersectional identities are on full display, you know, being a Canadian Arab living in France who happened to work on Obama's campaign. I mean, that's a, <laughs> a wonderfully rich uh, kind of understanding of, of the world that's that's part of that. And uh, also that, you know, your, your parents uh, and you were born in Damascus, Syria, right? Uh, yes. And grew up in Toronto so, and lived in Geneva and now living in, in France. That seems like it must have something to do with your ability to, and, and this is an interesting segue, I think, into, you know, sort of the digital anthropology thing, but your ability to look around across culture and across the stories we tell ourselves and those mythologies and be able to have some objectivity about them. Is that fair? Yeah, when I first moved to Europe, I was shocked, like genuinely shocked by the fact that entry level workers got 25 paid days off of vacation a year. I was like, what, how? I remember starting my first job in Canada and getting 10 days, including Christmas, including everything. And so um, living in Europe really opened my eyes to how a life that's 
that prioritizes different aspects of daily living could look like in practice. And, you know, in France, the first couple of years that I lived in France, in France, there's this thing called Le Grand Départ, which is the big departure, which is in August, basically the entire country shuts down and goes on vacation. And I remember the first like year or two being furious, like genuinely <laughs> furious, being like, how could they do this? What a dumb business idea. Everything's closed. Think of all the money they're missing. And then now, seven years in, August is my most favorite month because I started taking it off as well. And the first year I took the entire month off, which I've ne had never done in my life before, on like day like 17, it felt like my brain had undergone like a factory reset. I had never taken that long of a break and, and wasn't like hopping from country to country on like a big trip. I was just in the countryside, just hanging out. And I brought up a notebook with me and I said to myself, I'm not doing any work. I just brought a notebook for ideas. I came back in September with two notebooks filled with ideas. Wow. <laughs> That's fantastic. And it was just like, wow. Yeah. That's amazing. I remember too, I think the only time I've taken that long of a period off at once, uh, my late husband and I, in 1998, we did a three-week cross-country, uh, cross-America road trip. And I remember it was about day eight or 10 or so that I talked with one of my coworkers and she was asking me a question and I legitimately could not remember the answer to the question. Like <laughs> my brain was just so checked out from work and it was really nice. It was a really yeah. lovely experience. So yeah, at that and you've really just convinced me with those two notebooks. <laughs> I mean, you, your brain needs at least a week to just like unwind from the stress of work. Like we just need, it took me a week to just like recover to zero before I could go beyond zero. Yeah. And then the second you let your brain rest, like it all came pouring in. I still refer to that notebook, honestly, and just look at all the things that I wrote down. And I was like, wow, where did this come from? And it's like, well, of course, if you don't give it room to come out, it's if you're just constantly on planes and, you know, in deliverables and client stuff and business stuff, like you're never going to actually take the time to imagine new opportunities for yourself, new potentials for yourself. Yeah, oh, that's such a, a wonderful testimonial for <laughs> the value of <laughs> unplugging. So in describing yourself as a, as a digital anthropologist, are, are you saying that you study the cultures of the internet? Or is there a different way you would explain or articulate that? I study the interacting relationship between technology and culture. So one, how internet culture is evolving, but also how does culture impact technology and how does technology impact culture? So it's like this really interesting back and forth between the two. Yeah, that's true. There does seem to be a lot of that. And it, it seems like at first glance, your book, Hustle and Float, would seem like it's a departure from that field. But I would think that there's a lot of ways that technology and data and algorithms and, and digital cultures are driving us to workaholism and exhaustion and reactionary and polarized discourse and so on. So was that part of what drew you to writing the book or did that crossover just happen naturally? That crossover happened very naturally and randomly. The whole thing started because I got really frustrated when I had my own burnout that like I knew better but didn't do better. Hmm. And that was really frustrating to me. It's like I have the knowledge. Why couldn't I put the knowledge in practice? And then eventually I realized all of these belief systems and stories, they're embedded in every Instagram meme and every algorithm that asks you to refresh every 10 seconds and every um, notification that interrupts your time in the design of these tools where we're designing them to make, to socially shame people for not responding bad enough, or for, sorry, for not responding fast enough. So like with WhatsApp, for example, you know, the blue check marks that lets you know that the person you've sent the message to has seen and read your message. Like, what is that if not social pressure to like, respond. So right. we've also shaped technology to amplify the social norms that if you're left on red, that is a breach of etiquette that is like not okay, you know, and I started seeing more and more of these, especially like memes, there's so many like, as you called it earlier, productivity porn, like, mm -hmm. so many weird memes that are telling you the, the, the one that sticks out in my mind is one that says that assumes you've worked a full eight hour day at a job and then says, if you're not where you're at, have you been thinking what you're doing between midnight and 2 a.m. in the morning? Because that's when you should be building your side hustle in full seriousness. 
And I was just like, it just, you know, and then you see people that like read this and then make themselves feel bad because then they convince themselves that all they need is to work harder when maybe to be creative, all they need is actually to do less Mm -hmm. and to give their brains a chance to catch up. Yeah. And to use some of those coffee breaks where they're hitting their phone and social media to maybe actually go for a walk and let some of that space (laughs) happen. But it it is an interesting overlap and, and cross pollination almost. It seems like also meme culture is a really important part of understanding the the way that those um those concepts cross pollinate and i think i think about when eli pariser first talked about filter bubbles back in 2011 and it was like we were only experiencing a fraction of the algorithmic polarization we do now uh Mm -hmm. and and a lot of that is through memes it seems like you know the amplification and the dominance of meme discourse online. So when you look at the polarization and fragmentation of digital culture in 2020, and, and even looking beyond if, if you do, how do you think it affects us? And, and what is there to be done about it? What's interesting is that the polarization that you're seeing right now in the content ecosystem is the byproduct of a market that has prioritized personaliza- personalization in every single aspect of our lives. Like you can't expect people to personalize their 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 movie queue, their book queue, their playlists, and then somehow expect news to remain neutral, right? We created this entire technological reality where your subjective experience as an individual, your desires, what you like, what you want to see, what you agree with is constantly mirrored back at you. Hmm. And so then what happens is it's only a natural extension then that the information that you see also reflects your reality. What I think is quite interesting is that I believe that by frequenting in these filter bubbles, we have reduced our capacity to engage in things that we disagree with because we don't have to. We don't actively have to engage in anything that upsets us. We just click out, we mute, we block, we cancel, we eliminate it. So we can fully create an echo chamber of information that only ever reflects back our own worldview. And what that is doing is that it's making people get this false sense of reality where their opinions slowly become beliefs because it gets repeated over and over and over. And if every time you said something, a hundred people were like, yes, you're absolutely right, Kate. Yes, you're absolutely right, Kate. You're going to become more and more certain about your worldview. And then you're going to become less capable of navigating that worldview because you don't have to. And so you see this divisiveness. And I mean, what's interesting is when Facebook did those experiments of the different algorithms and how different two people on either end of the political spectrum, um, their their content that they were seeing and the sources that they were seeing, what we're, what we're doing is we're ripping people apart to the point where we can't even agree on a mutual reality anymore. Like sometimes I feel like I'm in my own reality and people on the other political spectrum are in their own reality and we're both like living in separate worlds, but it's the same world. And that's quite dangerous because if you can't find any common ground at all, how can you repair this divisiveness? And the worst part is, is that the going back to how technology influences culture, the metrics in play that are driving the revenue models for most of these technology platforms depend on you spending a lot of time on the platform. So it's this fundamental thing of what you want versus what you need. What you need is objective content from a variety of vetted and trusted sources. What you want is to constantly get the hit of validation because everyone agrees with you and you feel like you're right. So we're like little kids that have gotten nothing but a constant stream of junk food. And now we're wondering why we don't feel good and why we're getting like, we're, we're becoming really healthy. Right. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what it, we're, we're consuming information, junk and trash. And this is what's happening. Yeah. When you look at a fast growing phenomenon like TikTok, for example, what do you see in it? Do you see that it reflects any of that piece of culture or is it a completely different part of a, a, diff- a diff- different digital phenomenon? Sorry. No, t- I find TikTok really, really interesting because I think they're one of the few social networks that actually got it right in terms of like social community design. I'm going to put the data and the privacy and the, you know, all that stuff just to right. the side for a second because I know that's a big privacy issue, we should talk about it. I'm just literally talking about it from just the way that they've structured the flow of information. And if you think about it, TikTok understood that 
um, technology and social networks are an ecosystem where other platforms compete desperately to keep you and the content on their platforms in these walled communities. Mm -hmm. TikTok is like, take this content and share it. Take it and take it everywhere because they know you'll come back. That's the first thing. The second thing is what I think is really interesting about TikTok is that the algorithm totally capitalizes on people's need for attention. Because for those of you that don't know or who don't use TikTok a lot, you navigate the page through a main feed that's called the For You page. And the For You page shows you content, say 50% content from people you follow, but 50% content from, from people you don't follow, but whose content is popular on the app or whose content is aligned with the algorithms that you're searching for. What this means is that you don't need to build a large audience in order to hit to have a viral piece of content. So because there's like this lottery system where anyone's content can go viral, and, and I think at a much faster and easier rate than other platforms, people are creating content nonstop. Yeah. And the content is like so specifically tailored. Imagine like an endless neighborhood with like teeny tiny little micro communities. There's Viking TikTok and back pain TikTok and witch TikTok and small business TikTok and, and quantum physics TikTok and dance TikTok. And all these little tiny neighborhoods are constantly being cross pollinated from other social networks. That I think is a really innovative approach and why I think the app has been so popular. Do you find that really different from YouTube, for example? I mean, it seems like there's a similar kind of concept with channels and people creating content that really tailors to their niche audience. And then that content is shared out to other platforms and throughout the web and throughout social channels. Is it, What makes it different in terms of, is it the engagement within the platform? It's the fundamental understanding of meme culture as the main currency of distribution. So all of TikTok is using meme sounds and the memes evolve and the memes take on their own meaning and then they become popular and then memes rise and fall and trends rise and fall. So there are sounds that you're using and then like 30,000 people will use the same sound that will create a collective meme. And it's 15 seconds and it's really easy. And unlike the full gear that you need to produce a beautiful YouTube video, TikTok gives the creators everything that you need if you have zero technical experience to be able to take a piece of meme content to respond respond to it, copy it, imitate it, reshare it directly from the app. You don't have to upload anything separate. You don't have to do anything. Everything is done for you. But I think it's so powerful because it essentially organizes meme content. So you can take one sound and see all the people that have used it and essentially see the evolution of a meme from the first person that uploaded it all the way through the different stages of virality from remixing and reacting to reimagining um, and like recreating all of those things, you can follow it. And I think that is quite unique. So I know another sort of digital subculture you often talk about and, and research about is the BTS subculture and K-pop in general. Yes, K-pop. Is there a, an overlap between TikTok and the, the phenomenon of the virality of the, the meme culture? and BTS and K-pop and the, the sort of cam culture and things like that? Is, is, there, is there overlap or are they two separate functioning things? No, there's definitely overlap. Like TikTok is almost like a big like hub that everything can be sent out on. And if you think about it, you have this app that makes it really easy to create like a funky, short, snappy, incredibly catchy uh, piece of content that you can then whip out across the web. And K-pop stands or K-pop fans in general are incredibly well versed in leveraging all of these platforms to amplify their message at an insane scale. Like the quantity of tweets that you will see from one fandom to another fandom is like is in, in the millions. And BTS is really interesting because I find it particularly interesting where in a, in a quite like American centric social media landscape to have a boy band that the primary language is Korean that is able to come and interject itself in such a powerful way around the world. And that to me is like so interesting. And a lot of it depends on the labor of the fans. So they're called the 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 K Army. So so BTS, for example, their fandom's called Army. And the Korean army members, they will go to all the trouble and they were for free at their own cost, their own expense, translate content, explain content, subtitle content, do all of these things so that the I army, the international fans, get a chance to experience it as well. And they do that through TikTok, but they also do that through every other platform. So it's just like, like 
K-pop fans are just incredibly well versed at using the platforms to amplify their message. And um, TikTok just gave them another tool to be able to do that. Yeah, Anna Militovic says, tick, regarding TikTok, I call this the remixability index. Whole community iterates, unlike YouTube, etc. And then follows up and says, Twitter has remixability too, but doesn't handle abuse or bad actors well. So it seems yeah. like that's a really yeah. important piece of the discussion as well. Um, but uh, yeah, well, TikTok has had some trouble handling bad <laughs> yeah. actors as well. I think there's bad actors right. across the board. But right. um, but no, she's absolutely right. It's this meme. It's this it's the social currency of the language of the web that's just been like organized in a way that makes it accessible to a large group of people. I noticed, too, that you uh, you first you did your first uh, live in person event recently. And uh, by the way, was that strange or good or both or <laughs> It was good, and it was also very strange. It really uh, hammered home how different things were just from six months ago. You know, plexiglass in call-out rooms, chairs that were spaced, limits, masks everywhere. It just, um, in a way, I was very happy to have the opportunity to get back out there, but I was also a little bit sad because one of my favorite things to do at events is, like, meet people and exchange ideas and chat with them and, like, the conversations that happen and the friends that you meet – and it was very like limited and I was keeping my distance and I had a mask. And I said to you before, um, I'm a very, very pro mask person. I just want to start by saying mm -hmm. I wear masks all the time. But I did find that there was like a piece of that like human connection that was lost when I couldn't see somebody like smiling. I couldn't see their face, their micro expressions, their voice, their accent. Like that definitely added like a weird filter in the in, in the human interaction. Yeah, I would imagine so. But the reason why I actually uh, brought up this in-person event is because I noticed in the photos that you posted that you were talking with a group of CFOs about the business of BTS. And so I, uh, that sounds <laughs> awesome and amazing. I wonder if you could give us a little taste of what that talk is about. Yeah, they're just really prolific. And in uh, during the pandemic, when every a lot of music industries were like trying to figure out or music acts were trying to figure out what to do, BTS put together uh, a very interesting pay-per-view concert called uh, Bang Bang Con that broke the records for the highest number of concurrent viewers in a virtual con in a virtual concert. Seven hundred and fifty six thousand people from over one hundred and two different countries paid money in order to see uh, a BTS virtual concert, uh, netting the band almost $20 million just for that one event alone, which is like a huge, interesting data point. And yes, I know BTS is really big, but they offer an interesting proto, like an interesting prototype to follow. And the other thing that I thought was really cool, speaking about personalization, is so, you know, BTS has seven members and in K-pop, and, and I'm sure you, you probably know this, but in K-pop, you generally have a favorite mm -hmm. and that favorite member is called your bias so your bias is out of the seven members of say bts you have one member that you like maybe more than one but you know, one person that you, who's your bias and so what they did what the the video platform did was that every member had their own camera feed so that when you were watching the concert if your favorite member was um you know um I don't know, like Young or something, one of the members or, you know, you could click on his camera feed and no matter what was happening on the main stage, you knew that you could watch the entire concert centered on like your favorite bias. And I just thought, what a great thing to do because, you know, with fan, with the uh, cam culture and things like that, normally there's like fan feeds that do it. Mm -hmm. And what a great way to be able to create that opportunity for people to have that intimate experience. So things like that, um, uh, I, I talked about, I also talked about the Travis Scott, uh, Fortnite concert where they did a, he did a 10 minute set in Fortnite that was beautiful and incredible. And I would encourage you guys to go watch it if you haven't already. It just shows the potentiality of how entertainment on platforms can mix, which I think is going to be important as we try to navigate what this virus is going to do to our ability to gather and enjoy the arts together. Yeah, absolutely. It also seems like a lot of your work focuses on understanding youth culture and its, and its emerging impact on the internet and on the workplace and politics and so on. So as you think about 2020 and looking ahead through the pandemic, you know, what stands out to you in terms of how that's going to shape dominant culture? I've been particularly interested. I mean, I think youth culture 
I think young people are just take more risks sometimes and they iterate faster and they're open to new things. I feel even as an older millennial, you know, I, I have my habits and my platforms that I use and we sort of get set in our ways. So it's always kind of good to look at the next generation and to see, uh, by the way, the, the uh, Gen Z has announced that we're no longer using like the crying laughing emoji. So if you are uh, not just, just so everybody knows that has been the, the, the next update, use the, the laughing crying cat emoji or the skull emoji. Just want to make sure everyone got the memo about the latest cool technology. It's very kind um, of you considering that the host is Gen X. <laughs> like we need to make sure <laughs> that we stay cool like, and man, in the currency like, of the youth. From my messages. I was like, no. Um, what, what I think is interesting is this idea of micro content and we're seeing content, you know, in the era of Vine and especially TikTok that we're delivering messages and say under a minute. What I'm finding really fascinating is people's ability creatively to jam pack quite nuanced and intense conversations within that small period of time. So now on TikTok, now that the all of us older people are on TikTok, you're seeing, for example, like economists, quantum physicists, teachers, doctors, dermatologists, psychiatrists that are coming in and that are talking about like intense stuff, but they're able to, to deliver it in this like small narrative. I saw a woman who was a, a quantum physicist who was like talking about Stephen Hawking's, you know, her, his theories to like hip hop music. And she was explaining it in a way. And I just thought, you know, it's, there's never been an easier time to learn something in snippets. The counterpart of that though, is I often wonder what we miss if we move towards a skimming culture and not a deep dive culture. And I noticed this in myself and I like tried to watch a movie the other day, a two hour movie. And then within 30 seconds, I almost felt myself being like, okay, where's the punchline? What's the point? What's the next? But I don't want to lose that. So I think that we as a society have to focus on developing this like deep dive focus, because if all we're ever doing is like skip, 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 scroll, 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 we're going to lose our capacity to engage with an idea with the depth that it requires in order to make some of these tackle some of these challenges that we have. Yeah, it seems like a really interesting compliment to have that skimming culture and the ability to compress a great deal of information and, and insight into a 15 second, you know, to be versed in the currency or the the language of how that's done, you know, with the, the sort of gesturing up and having, you know, bands of text and things like that. You know, <laughs> if people understand the how to be fluent in that language, then a lot of information can be conveyed quickly. But yeah, it does have to, it seems like it's something that we have to have running alongside, you know, more in depth knowledge transfer and, and learning. But yeah, how do we how do we ensure that I guess is is a different question. By the way, mm -hmm. Tammy Evans gave us a little cat laughing with tears emoji just to prove <laughs> got that it. she can stay hip and spider <laughs> says so hard to keep up. <laughs> so, I feel you. I, uh, I wanted to pivot just to, uh, before we run out of time. I, I love the story of how you came to work for Obama's digital campaign, uh, but would you mind recapping for the audience of how that came to be? Yeah, sure. I was uh, working as the research coordinator on uh, a book by a brilliant man named Don Tapscott. And we were researching how technology was influencing millennials at that point in time. It was for a book called uh, Grown Up Digital. Uh, and as a part of that process, one of the research focus areas that I was responsible for was politics. And this was like 2000 and seven, I'm going to say. So all the insights would seem quite pedestrian to us now. It's like Twitter, it's a thing, you know, like <laughs> that was where we were at, at, you know, people should use Facebook. Like this was kind of where we were at. Uh, but part of the research, we spoke to several members of um, Barack Obama's new media team. And one of whom, uh, a guy by the name of Chris Hughes, one of the co-founders, we interviewed him and him and I sort of hit it off and, and ended up striking a bit of a friendship. We were both, you know, into very similar things things. And a couple of weeks later, I, I emailed him and I was asking if I could just come down for like the weekend, you know, can I just come down and just like check out what was happening? Because we momentum of the campaign was starting to build up and people were beginning to say, hey, these guys are doing really cool things with social media. And nobody was doing similar things. And so I really wanted to go see. Um, and he wrote back and he said, look, like, yes, you can come for the weekend. But you know, we need all hands on deck. So if you have the time, this might be a crazy idea, but why don't you just come down and just work with us on it? And it was one of those moments, you know, the hairs on the back of your neck stands up and you just think <laughs> this is an opportunity. 
this is a, and so I put everything on pause. I packed my stuff up. My uh, husband, then boyfriend drove me overnight to Chicago and like three, four days later, I was on the, as a volunteer on the digital, like in national campaign headquarters in Chicago, working on the, on the digital strategy, which was such a wild, wild ride. Yeah, I would imagine so. And it must be a really interesting lens to have, you know, looking now at, at politics or ever since then, looking at politics and elections and particularly so for the American audience right now and presumably for the French audience looking ahead to 2022, what should we understand about the evolution of, of digital culture and how it affects political campaigns and elections, especially as we just talked about, you know, virality and remixability and meme discourse and, and all of these different platforms that are allowing the compression of information. Um, what do we need to know and how do we need to think about political discourse and campaigning in this moment? To me, the most important things we need to tackle, and I mean, I don't know why we can't just do this immediately. This is my like million dollar idea sort of thing is I think we need to have the capacity on any platform that we use to turn off the algorithm. Having an algorithm choose what we see is the one of the biggest threats because I always ask people, think about all the information that you consume in a day and think about what percentage of that information was selected for you by an algorithm. We need to have an ability to go outside of this power that this like little piece of code has to go out and select our own information or start holding companies accountable to producing information that is much more balanced. They can do that. We can say, hey, you know what? We've seen that you've consumed 50% of your news from this one really biased source. We're going to start piping in other things for you to see. So I think one, understanding how influence, like how much we can be influenced. I was going to say influenceable, but I don't know if that's a word. You made it a word. Okay. I don't know. Uh, here we go. You, hear, you <laughs> I made it a word. First. But like how influenced you can be. And everyone thinks like, were these rational decision makers and digital contagion is real, how your feed impacts your mood is real, uh, the impact and the power of the words you give to your friends is real. So all of these things have a much bigger power over us, as the Cambridge Analytica thing mentioned, than we would like to admit. So first and foremost, we need to understand these tools can influence us for good or for bad. And then to look at the algorithm and start to say, okay, like, we need to get people back to this curiosity and seeking information out in a way that's much more balanced. And if they're not going to do it for themselves, then we have to start holding some of these technology companies accountable for um, piping certain information, especially when you have platforms uh, that can micro target you to the fact of whether or not you took a vacation, whether or not you've ever searched for cold medicine in the last three months, whether like think about that mm -hmm. and think about what it means for somebody to say, I know everything about you and I'm going to give you the thing that's custom tailored to you that's most likely to change your mind or most likely to get you to believe a certain thing. That to me is terrifying because if democracy depends on an informed populace, we are eroding people's capacity to be informed. And so that is very terrifying to me. Yeah, and do you feel like this is a platform requirement or do you feel like it's a regulation, regulatory requirement? Like something that needs to happen, that, there, that consumers hold platforms accountable to be able to in, implement features that turn off algorithm, uh, algorithmic feeds, for example? Or do we, we think we need to go and make sure that governments put these regulations in place? I mean, being in Europe where they have a much more, um, you know, strict approach, I think, for example, giving people the option to opt out of an algorithm if they want should be considered just like a digital right. You should be able to turn it off if you want. Like you should. Uh, I don't know why you can't. So I think and I reason I think that it has to come from government is that um, precedent has shown us that these companies aren't that great at regulating themselves. And so it's not just governments, the, the missing piece, what people often don't like to hear is we all want to point fingers at this big company or that big company. But it's like, guess what? We're all using it. We're all complicit. If you're using these technologies actively, you are complicit. And maybe complicit is too harsh of a word. Maybe it's accountable. You're accountable for 
what's happening. Mm -hmm. So it's also, you can't turn around and say, well, this big company did this and I don't like it. And then it's like, okay, well, do you use their services? Yes. Do you use their app? Yes. Did you read the privacy terms? No. Did you read the terms of service? No. Then it's kind of like, okay, well, (laughs) we at some point too, as citizens have to stand up and take accountability for the way that we use these tools. But it has to be like, we have to push for it. They're not going to, companies are not going to mess with revenue models that bring them hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. They're just not going to do it. So we have to decide what the real cost is. And right now, the real cost is that we're literally selling pieces of our digital identities to the highest bidder. And we're not exactly sure how those pieces are being used against us. That to me is terrifying. I kind of wonder, tell me what you think about this. I kind of wonder if in like 20 years, social networks will have the same warning labels like cigarettes do. Do you know what I mean? Like if some point in 20 years, we'll look back and we'll be like, I can't believe they used to use all of this data without any of these like warnings but i don't know sometimes i just feel like people just like don't care it's just gone so slowly and so you know so far it's like the frog in in boiling water so yeah i I think that's an interesting question and i'd like to throw it out to our audience and see uh what people think if there's a um a future where we have warning labels on algorithmic (laughs) experiences Uh, anna malishevic says do consumers understand enough about how platforms work to request this referring to yeah yeah and I, i think you're you're shaking your head I, I agree. It, it seems like it's a, uh, it's not just a big ask for consumers to to reach that level of education to be able to hold com- companies and platforms accountable, but there's uh, there's so many competing interests and and things competing for people's attention all the time. It's hard enough just to get a simple message through about how algorithms do shape experiences, let alone the importance of how the uh, the blended algorithmic experiences are shaping our realities in terms of the political outcomes and so on. But very good question, Anna. I feel like that's a, a an important point. Well, they don't. They don't. Like when people, and think about it, when the first social networks came on stage and asked us to share the, our data with them, there wasn't that much data and it wasn't all connected. Now it's like websites can track you across the web. So like the information that was available about you, say in 2004, is nowhere near the information that's available about you in 2020. But many consumers seem to think like still have that disconnected island view. And instead, you know, now you're starting to see, okay, we can actually track a consumer across websites, across like we can we have such a an interesting idea. We can we can triangulate. It's not just where you are, it's your phone and it's the people that you're with and it's your geolocation and it's all this other stuff that I don't even think people realize they're giving away. And that's the problem. And then they think, oh well, I'm not doing anything wrong. And like it's like, well, that's not the point. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I find we have to keep having those conversations for sure. Agreed. Yeah. So one last uh, thought or question I wanted to ask you is I know you were formerly the associate director of the Technology Pioneer Program at the World Economic Forum in Geneva, where you helped identify disruptive startups that were improving the state of the world. And when I think about, you know, one of the recurring questions that I ask guests is, uh, you know, what technologies do you see on the horizon that seem like a boost to humanity? It seems like you're in an interesting place to have been observing that and probably have a discipline of paying attention to the technologies that are emerging. So what do you, what, when you think about what could, what technologies could actually help humanity, uh, what do you think about what types of technologies occur to you? I mean, for me, the reality is, is I think everything that's has the capacity to help us, it's just that it's going to also simultaneously hurt us in some new and different ways. And so I try to navigate the complexity of how can we hold that duality together? So for example, if you take like even just like AI, AI has done tremendous good for humanity. It's helped us diagnose disease faster. It's helped us um, understand data better. It's helped us like, you know, and there's so many ways that it's actually improved the human experience, but at the same time, it's also created a lot of new problems. So I think, I think it's all of the technology has the capacity. I mean, um, we, if it wasn't for Twitter or Facebook, we would not have met. That's right. If it, right. So, and so I think about that and I think, well, there are so many people I'm close to. So Anna, who's commenting her interesting questions, I met her through you on Twitter as well. <laughs> and so it's like, if those platforms didn't exist, my social network, my capacity to engage with interesting, smart people would be so limited. But at the same time, it's like the same platform that gave you these cool people is also the platform that enables like trolls and enables you know, weird antisocial behavior. So I don't necessarily think about what's going to help humanity. I think about what new 
what new challenges are going to emerge with this technology and how can we navigate that? Because for every single case of facial recognition that actually helps to catch a criminal, there's a case of where it's being used to breach privacy. Yeah, so at for least me, one the to question one, right? Becomes, I mean, at <laughs> least, at least. More than that. More, I mean, you know, but like smart cars are going to help, they're going to hurt. And so the bigger question for me becomes is like, how can we prepare people to hold the this duality, because what worries me is that a lot of the tech crowd comes in and they try to push you this utopian version. And then other people come in and they try to push you the dystopian version. And the thing is, is like both of those are not true, but both of those are true in different ways. It's like, I always say it's going to be equally awesome and equally terrible at the same time. And that's why it's going to be so hard to predict the future because we're going to have technology that's going to make our world amazing. And we're going to have technology that's going to equally make our world terrifying and we just have to continuously ask ourselves what side of the equation are we falling on i love that and it's so it re- i relate so much to the idea of holding that duality and embracing both the both andness of you know the dystopia and the utopia uh also it feels like that's a real sort of recurring theme through your work of being able to say you know hey look uh productivity is great creativity is great <laughs> you have to be able to embrace the both and this of productive time and downtime in order to to be your best self and do your best work right yeah and you were the one that said this to me i think a long time ago when we talked about your work and it was i think we were talking about like this idea of dystopia utopia and i remember we said something along the lines like well humans are flawed and messy we're great and we're awful all at the same time and so how can we expect our technology to be different right every act of altruism every act of deviancy like those things are just who we are as humans and so it surprises me sometimes that we hold our technology to a standard that doesn't even reflect like our own reality as a species we're like a super great species we're a super trash species depending on like (laughs) the issue and the time but that's that complexity is who we are and our technological reality is always going to reflect that fact that's perfect uh, what a great note to to close on and we're at time so how can people find and follow your amazing work online uh i'm everywhere online so rahaparfush.com or rahaparfush on twitter or fushi on instagram would love to connect with people any friends of kate or in kate's network of of peers or people i definitely want to meet so don't be shy come say hello Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rahaf. Thank you, everyone who's tuned in. And thank you to our podcast listening audience when it makes it to that medium as well. Everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you, Rahaf, again. And enjoy your evening, as I know it's uh, a good deal later where you are. (laughs) Take care.